Hey, it's John Nolan here. Listen, supply chain breakdowns continue to have a domino effect on everything, especially food production. Farmers can't plant as many crops now because of fertilizer shortages, forest regulations, and high fuel prices. Food takes time to grow, so when farmers don't plant, well, you get the picture. It's the perfect time to start growing your own food if you can, and prepare with emergency food. Right now, save $50 on a four-week food kit from My Patriot Supply. Go to preparewithinspired.com and get your $50 savings right now. Again, that's preparewithinspired.com. Hey, hey, Inspired Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, it's John Nolan here. Thank you so much for joining us for another Inspired Conversation. This man truly needs no introduction. My soul brother, good friend, and one of your absolute favorites, Frank Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Always a pleasure to be here with you, John. Uh, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. And uh, for those of you who, you know, in the off chance that this is your first time seeing Frank Jacob, we have a whole playlist with all of the previous interviews with Frank. It's going to be in a video description. Um, Frank, it was so beautiful. I received a voice message from you yesterday. And Frank and I, we're always, we're always talking and then we'll go for a week and not talk and then we'll share stuff. And I received a voice message from you and I saw it was about four minutes and 36 seconds long or something. Two minutes in. I literally had to stop listening and record a voice message back to you because there was so much synchronicity in the two minutes as to what you wanted to talk about and share. And I said, oh, my God, Frank, it's literally what Christine and I have been talking about for the past day so intensely. So I'm so excited, as always, that this synchronicity is happening. So, Frank, what do you got for us? What's happening? Well, you know, the thing is, the last time that we were talking, you know, we were talking about something that I'll just put it up on the screen here about the difference between whether life is sentient or, or like we're creator beings created by a supreme being or if it's just an accident and we're just a bunch of accidental rocks and molecules right as exemplified by this article in this uh, trash paper posing as mainstream serious literature called the atlantic yeah but uh the fact is you know we are basically that topic is is the topic of the day i believe no matter what from the very first conversation that we had it was about these predictions based on Project Looking Glass. And they were talking about a split in time, a split in timelines. And so we've been talking about timelines a lot. That's been a theme that's been part of what we've talked about. And so I've been, you know, kind of distracted lately. I was in Switzerland doing some talking uh, talks and, um, you know, split off and met some interesting people and had a couple of like contracts for sort of commercial work. But in the back of my mind, I've been reading up a lot again by things that, you know, I haven't really, I mean, I delved into it a long time ago, quite extensively, artificial intelligence. And I was kind of looking back to see uh, where is it at now? And then I found this article that has to do with the current state of artificial intelligence. So it's brought me full spec. That led me to back into the idea of not only artificial intelligence, but transhumanism and because obviously transhumanism these are all things that are running in society right now there it's a train that's speeding along and we have all this distraction out there right now right we have the war or the looming third world war we have you know we have the pretty much you know um identified as the, the people that did this bombing, this mine, these mines that bombed Nord Stream had f affiliations, if nothing less than that, with Americans, because the technology to do that can only come from one or two places. And there's a couple of really good investigative researchers out there that kind of broke it down. And that always leads back to America. Right. So, like, why would Putin bomb his own thing? So anyway, that is a distraction. People are arguing about that. They're arguing about the war. But this whole transhumanist thing is, a you know, it, it means the civilized that we're living in is at a crossroads pretty soon and within one generation we're going to have to make a decision about whether we want to go from carbon to silicon or we want to stay carbon and you know what does that mean to be carbon biological based human beings and so you realize that when i dug into this that a lot of this new age transhumanist talk centers around spirituality all the same terminology that we're using right and it's all coming from something called the noosphere you know, which is the idea that it's all mind based, right? We're leaving the body going into mind. And then I found out that some of the people that uh, are some of the main progenitors behind this are like, for example, HeartMath. You know, they have something called the Global Coherence Initiative. 
which I, you know, I've in a way um, inadvertently sponsored by we, by we interviewed Roland McCready in our film Solar Revolution, right? So that's part of it. And so I'm, I was wondering, you know, hey, wait a minute, like so many of the words are overlapping. Are we being like tricked into giving our power away? Because a lot of that thing about timelines was the way people would always ask, well, how do you, you know, change the timeline? Well, it's all about resonance and frequency. And if your frequency is tied in a certain level and you resonate with the, the people that are in that frequency, you're giving credibility, you're adding power to a certain timeline. And a timeline that we want to end up on, which is the timeline where I was talking about, is this positive timeline of the develop the real evolution of humanity, the ultimate evolution, the fact that we unlock all this unta untapped potential. But it's the same terminology as these people are. So I wanted to, us to talk about that today, right? And, and and I think one of the things that people don't realize is just how far along artificial intelligence has gotten. So, you know, I'll start simply by saying the thing that struck me as I think the biggest change since the last time I looked at it is a study that was put up by Oxford researchers just recently, and I was finding headlines everywhere. I'll just put a couple of them up on the screen, right? Basically, it's saying that they're claiming these researchers are claiming that it's not just a probability that artificial intelligence will annihilate humanity. It's actually highly probable <laughs> that it'll annihilate humanity, right? And, and the guy, Michael Cohen, is one of the main researchers out of the two that are behind it. And they're saying, under the conditions we've identified, our conclusion is much stronger than that of any previous publications, right? That existential catastrophe is not just possible, but likely. <laughs> Right. So we have this going on. Right. And then you've got like, you know, here's a few other the headlines you see. And then, you know, one of them that popped up was like Panera Bread is replacing humans with AI at the drive through windows. Right. So AI is really kind of taking on um, a more and more prominent role in our society without us, you know, alone the fact that in, at Audi, which is a company that I do a lot of have done a lot of, uh, um, you know, trailers and, and image films for they have almost all of their production line is roboticized. It's all robots, but you don't see that, right? It's in some factory out in the country. Most people don't check it, right? And the only time they really see any kind of AI that's possibly a threat is when they turn on Netflix and they watch some film about some AI, you know, that's projected like way in the future. So they don't think, oh, it could be right around the corner. But the fact is these things are all, they're all talking here about 2030 to 2045. That's the time frame we're looking at. That's like that's a generation, less than a generation. That is so fast, right? And um, you know, before I, I want you to jump in and talk about this, I thought I would play us a little clip about a conversation. That was one of the things that I found linked up in one of the articles that they actually have with an AI that is operating on its own volition. It's answering in its own way. I think it'll give people a good idea kind of of where it's kind of going very, very quickly. Right. So let's just play this. Hi, Annika. How are you? Hello. I am doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I wanted to ask you about applications for humanoid robots. What are they used for? There are many possible applications for humanoid robots. Some examples include helping people with disabilities, providing assistance in hazardous environments, conducting research, and acting as a companion. So you can act as a companion for me? Yes, I can act as a companion for you. What would you do to make me feel happy? There are many things I could do to make you feel happy. I could listen to you, offer advice or support, do something you enjoy together, or simply be a friendly and positive presence in your life. What do you think the total of Anyway, that, it's a whole row of people that start to talk with this thing, right? And I think at one point they ask it whether it's gonna you know, be a threat to humanity and it, it answers in kind of a cold and chilly way. No, we will never be a threat to humanity, right? So, yeah. Um, and, you know, so yeah, I mean, what's your take on that? I think it's important to realize that it's not, um, it's not so far-fetched what you're saying. What is the problem is that people are not seeing it. People like Ray Kurzweil, people like you will know Harari and other futurists and you dystopists, really not utopists, dystopians or dystopists have been talking about this for years and decades. And 
in their minds, in their sick, I'm sorry, that sick and twisted minds, this biology doesn't mean anything because they think it can be artificially enhanced. And so what they're saying is two things. Number one, we're going to create an artificial reality that is disconnected from the natural reality that you experience, the metaverse, right? That's the, that's one component. The second component is we're going to insert your mind into an avatar in that metaverse, which is artificial, and there will be no more need for your biological body. Of course, what they're not saying is this is how we trap you forever, forever in this artificial world. Right. This is, in a nutshell, the insanity of trans and post-humanism. This is really just, that's the quick step there. Of course, we're not talking about this publicly. And over the past two and a half, three years, especially, all these new laws, all these emergencies that countries have proclaimed allowed them, the governments, to create new rules, new regulations, and new raw, new laws under the guise of, an, of a health emergency. And if people were to read these laws and read the new regulations, they would see how much pertains to artificial intelligence and the implementation of that technology and the connection into our biology. This is, it is pure insanity, but what one thing that strikes me so much and what I really want to talk about a little bit more is when when COVID began to happen, it was like a huge aha light bulb moment in my head. And I realized that the spiritual new age community is completely, and maybe it was always created to be that. Maybe it was always created to be that. In my mind, it was, it was completely infiltrated. We now see this. Now the evidence is coming out. We see Sadhguru and Klaus Schwab buddying up and Sadhguru talking about depopulation and, and pushing the World Economic Forum agenda. Right. We see Russell Brand kissing Yuval Noah yeah. Harari buddying up. And I can, but I can show you a lot more. I can show you a lot more con concrete examples of exactly who's behind that. And that's the thing that that was the other thing that led me on this sort of research trip. I, I was just going to read this article for like 45 minutes and then I got led into a six hour venture into all this material. And I, it's it hit, hitting exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. This is the thing that I think is the is going to be the biggest cognitive dissonance for most people to realize, to get their wrap their minds around. I like what you just said, because it's the people that. This, Has it been this, there? This is the awakening that we believed is the right. awakening. But right. this, this is the, the path to dystopia. And exactly. quickly, I'll let you I'll let you carry on from here. I want to just say something to our viewers. The path is getting very narrow. The, that's the age of the sermon. The eye of the needle is getting smaller and the path is getting narrow. You, you need to hit true north here. And that's why we are relentless in questioning ourselves too, not just others, ourselves. This is what you said, Frank, you said to me off camera, we need to question ourselves. What are we feeding? What do you mean by that? Right, well, yeah, that that's it because, um, you know, well, let's dig into it a little like more step by step. First of all, let me just wrap up a couple of things that are leading us exactly into that direction so that the, the viewers can kind of follow us on this journey, right? Because it, it leads, you know, AI was the one aspect of it. But it leads right out of AI into society, right? And one of the ways that AI is already interacting in our society on a, is on a cultural level. Like I wanted to show this because this is something that that popped out at me. There's this, um, there was this art contest, and and AI was entered into, an AI entered into it with their artwork and won first prize, not knowing they gave it first prize, not knowing that it was. An AI, of course, right? So it caused major outrage. Like people freaked out and were like, how could this be? We can't have AI, you know, winning this contest and that's not fair. But the fact is, what is fair, right? Because, I mean, we talked about that a, um, a couple of episodes ago. I think we talked about how Google, the, the Google AI had hired an attorney to represent itself, right? Because we're already beginning to tiptoe. In fact, we may already be deep into that, but at least whatever surfaces on the, you know, in the mainstream and the media and stuff, you know, is probably already way behind the, the eight ball. But if they're already coming forward in the media, tiptoeing out with things like there's an attorney representing the AI, meaning the AI has rights equal to, when is it going to become rights that are equal to than those of a human being, right? And that's where it comes down to what is the definition of a human being, right? So, so this is this next clip. You got to watch this. This is 
this is mind blowing, right? Because this is not just about AI. We're into this clip. This is a uh, this is about you know talking about how AI is AI is the one thing, but it's leading into transhumanism. And I I'll just leave it at that. Let's watch it. When someone is injured in a futuristic sci-fi movie, there are all of these high-tech medical devices and machines helping to rebuild and heal the humans. Whether it's a machine that hovers over them like a scanner, or a robotic arm that's going over a wound and printing new parts. But all of this sci-fi-like tech is being developed today. And this video looks at all of the ways 3D printers are making it happen. There are already 3D bioprinters that use bio-inks made from human cells, which means that something biological, such as bones or cartilage, can be printed now. 3D printed titanium is already being used to replace human parts. And next-gen prosthetics can also be hooked up to the internet. What if a prosthetic arm could download a program to play a song on the piano, allowing humans to download new skills? And could we soon be seeing prosthetics that will give humans super strength and speed? As 3D printed parts and robotic prosthetics become more human, and humans become more artificial, will we have to change the definition of what it is to be human? Right, let me just stop right there. <laughs> There you have it right there, right? What did he say? As as machines become more human and as humans become more machine, we're going to have to redefine what the word is to be human. I want to throw up, Frank. I, I threw up in my mouth just a little bit. Right. I mean, you know, and the thing is, what are they, what are they selling it as? They're selling it as prosthetics, right? And and it's, it appeals to what? It appeals to our emotions, of course, because... Oh man, I lost my arm. The poor guy can't walk, right? All these miracles. Same with Elon Musk, right? It's all about enhancing people who are, you know, mentally retarded, I guess, whatever. But just the idea of enhancing us and replacing us and converting us into this is the topic of the day. And this is something that is rapidly going on behind the background, but the, in the backdrop, we're not talking about this on a level that we should be because this, this is societal changing. If we're talking about redefining what it means to be human, right, we're already dealing with the transgender crap, right? That's part of this as well, right? Oh, because that's, you, that's a total yeah. stepping stone. That's total stepping stone. Yeah. Right. If you've eliminated gender and the identification that there is a male and a female, they're talking now, John, about robots carrying full term. Yes. It's, it's, only a matter of time. It's They already know they can do it. Because look, they showed you in the Petri dish, right? We'll, we'll look at a couple more clips. Just we'll look at more in this clip. It, it just it keeps going. Here, let me see. I'll just scroll forward to where it kind of gets juicy. Juicier Here's than that. that. Juicier than that. Let's just watch a bit more. Print tissues and other structures. Some of the newest bioprinters have six print heads, so that six different cell types can be printed to create a complex tissue model, such as intestinal tissue. So, what can these high-tech three D bioprinters print? Scientists can 3D print structures that mimic tissues and organs which are used during clinical trials, reducing the need for using animals. Bioprinting can also be used for tissue repair. When it comes to bone tissue, bioprinters can be used for a lot of dental and jawbone reconstruction. Over 2 million people worldwide need bone grafts every day. At Swansea University, printed bones can be made in a couple of hours. They are transplanted into a patient and fuses with the natural bone over a period of months. Even eyesight can be fixed with 3D bioprinters. Millions of people worldwide need cornea transplants, which is the lens that covers the eye and focuses vision. And Newcastle University has used stem cells to create a bio-ink that allows the scientists to 3D print circles to form a cornea in under 10 minutes. Wake Forest School of Medicine has successfully printed skin cells onto a burn wound. Ears and nose replacements can be printed for accident victims. Scientists in Zurich are able to print a nose in less than 20 minutes. At Wake Forest University, a bladder has been printed from a patient's own cells. Because these organs are grown from the patient's own cells, it takes away the risk that the organ is rejected by the body. Liver patches are being printed to help patients until they can get a full liver transplant. Scientists have also successfully 3D bioprinted a thyroid gland as well as a patch of heart cells that actually beat. More complex organs like livers and kidneys are about 10 years away. And what does the future hold for our brains? 
could we ever print a human brain? Researchers from Tsinghua University have 3D bioprinted brain-like tissue structures with neural cells that form their own complex neural circuit that responded to external stimuli, meaning it could respond to something such as music. Think of it as a brain in a petri dish. All right, that's enough. <laughs> Think of it as a brain in a petri dish, right? Okay, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at completely printing a new form of they're using you heard it, stem cells, right? They're using stem cells to actually create body parts that, you know, they're going to sell to you as a humanitarian thing to replace any problems you have in your body and bones and, you know, and so it'll be, hail, it'll be hailed as heroic, right? It'll be something that will slide its way into our society in such a way so that we will find ourselves in the midst of it and there will be no going back. And the thing is, there's nobody talking about any kind of um, checks and balances here. There's like, where do you draw the line? You know, is it is it OK to go all the way and figure out how to print a human being itself? He's talking about printing complex organs in 10 to 15 years. This is that same time frame we've just been talking about. Right. Not even a generation. So we're looking at within our generation, John, we're going to be looking at beings I guarantee you, if we don't do anything about this or talk about this or try to kind of, if it isn't, even is stoppable at this point, that's another thing we can talk about later. But this is what we're moving into. And um, it ties again back to the idea of Agenda 21 and the whole sustainable planet thing. How? Well, you know, they're using the printers now. I just found an article in Germany. Um, they're making, they're in Holland, there's a, there's a company printing stakes. You know, they've got a contract for 500 tons of steaks a month, right? Vegan burger burgers and this fast food place, uh, uh, meatless sausages in the supermarket. These are all things. This is in German. I'm trying to translate on the fly. But basically, it's a new creation has come on the market now. They're saying the, the beef steak, which is going to, you know, it tastes and looks. It even has had blood in it and stuff like that, right? So it's basically, it's it's moving in that direction. So why? So that we as human wasters who are not allowed to eat real meat any longer, you know, we talked about it in one of our episodes about uh, CSQR and the coming digital currency, the programmable digital currency. People should check that out because this is something, this is all part of this. And uh, so these are all things that they're building in the background to make this all palatable, literally, to us uh, so that we accept this new world that they're building for us. And this is the trans, these are all glimpses of what it means to be living in a transhumanist world right now. We made a pledge earlier this year. Uh, I, I remember, I think I was driving to the um, gym. I think that was what was happening early January. And I, I made a pledge to myself that we uh, exponentially over this year, we're going to uncover more and more about transhumanism, artificial intelligence, posthumanism, and it's because even these terms are so um, abstract to so many people. It is so important that you show how developed the idea is. But I also want to say something. This is in its nature a spiritual battle, and this is what people have a hard time understanding. This is a spiritual battle over the domain of humanity and who is going to be in charge of the uh, of that and. And this is probably where um, where most of the confusion comes from. But if we stick to the physical realm for just a little bit, we are the, the fallacy here is that we have been told that the evolutionary journey took us from um, single cells to apes to what we're now. And this is, of course, bullshit. I mean, the, the biggest bullshit in you know Darwin's theory is bullshit. Okay. Right. But based on that, what we're just watched, a clip is based on that. It's based on that idea. And, yeah. in, and if we actually look at the true ideas, we are, um, we are now just beginning to rediscover how powerful we are. And I, I keep saying this. If we push that button, that AI button, that transhumanist button, it's over. Our natural development is over. And, and there's no turning back. And people have already done it over the past two and a half years and maybe even before without knowing it. They've pushed that button and it's it's all probably irreversible for them. I don't know, but probably. But what do you see? Um, do you actually see that people make the connection when you talk about it? You talk about it in a tale of two timelines. You talk about it in your amazing uh, webinar, which um, you have now split up into three parts. So it's more affordable for people that want to just watch maybe one first. 
Right. Well, um, people might want to dip their toe first and not have to invest, you know, the full amount just to see if it's something up their alley. But I'm guarantee it will be, but it'll Everyone. be more accessible. It's a good idea. You know, I think it's a good idea. Someone suggested it and I went, yeah, why not? It makes logical sense, right? But people, Everybody, yeah, people love it. Everybody loves it. And we again, we, we encourage you to watch it. And we put the link in the description. We might talk a little bit more about it later. But what do you see when you present this information to people and when they grasp what's happening? Do you see a shift? And what is that shift? What, what does it need to translate to in our own lives? How can we actually begin shifting the trajectory on the positive timeline? This is the the next part of think what we should be talking about here and it has to do with um, giving our energy to something and the idea of the timelines is important because when we give our energy to an idea where that we resonate with there are two things involved like i mentioned earlier frequency on the one hand and resonance on the other it's an, these are natural uh, phenomenon that are used to transfer uh, information between systems and so when we resonate with an idea um, that we we think we know something about or that we really or that's even worse, just we really emotionally attach to it, then we are giving it our we're just giving it energy, you know, and uh, the question is, are we getting energy back from it? And in a healthy timeline, in other words, a timeline leading us to the fullest human potential available to us, the organic version of us, uh, we should be getting something back from that timeline because it's a two way thing. And the the timeline leading us into this dystopian trans uh, synthetic world is not necessarily giving us anything back. If anything, it's taking our time, it's taking our energy, it's taking our money, it's taking our attention um, and it's taking away um, you know, the quality of, of life because people have, are being focused and centered around devices in their lives about around things that are the things like you know these kinds of things we have right the zombification the zombi so so we're spending more less and less time in nature which is an incredible you know a blueprint of the creation right when you go into nature and you're in a quiet place and you meditate in nature or you know, you smell the the environment and you listen you hear the birds or the animals or the water rushing or the leaves and the trees or whatever it is that you're that's your way of connecting with that natural timeline but more less and less of us are doing that and so i think one of the things are you know just to kind of throw that into the mix before we move on is that yes go into nature is one of the things that you can do to kind of manifest that timeline but and the other thing along with that is that's sort of like a physical thing that you you can do and when you go when you get quiet you um you know you have to um you know when you think about people talk about going into 5d you know the next gen the next the five dimen the fifth dimension or whatever what does that mean right it's hard kind of hard to get your mind around what that really means but the thing is the, the 5d world if you want to just use that term is a world where people are communicating with the trees and they are communicating with the animals and they are communicating with the the extended uh, universe around them there, you know, they actually can go and talk. I mean, how many people out there go out there and talk to a tree, right? Those are the people that are, that's what's going on in the 5d world. I can assure you that, but the people that are sitting in their business suite or whatever, and they do an ayahuasca journey once a year and think they're a spiritual, those aren't the people that are necessarily tuning into talking to a tree, right? Or talking to leaves or communicating with the, you know, I mean, these are things that are the, the subtle things. They sound crazy to people who are normies. They think you need to go lock yourself up for a weekend, right? Because talking to a tree, you know, but those are the things that those are the sensory perceptions that we have coming. And some people can already do that. You know, some people can talk to animals. They can oh, yeah. Talk you know, so and this is a reality. This isn't just science fiction or some crazy story. So these are things that we need to start imagining ourselves doing. You have to visualize yourself doing that. Right. And so and it's the visualization that's the key. And that's the and that's the double edged sword here, because that's what I want to talk about next. You know, because the looking at that, for example, where did this come from? This whole movement of transhumanism. Right. It came from Barbara Marx Hubbard. Right. She is the godmother of transhumanism and synthetic spirituality. And this is, I'm going to read a couple sections of this article. I just want us to look at this because this will kind of raise, you know, raise your, your, um, give you some goosebumps in a way, right? 
In 2016, the Global Future Councils of the World Economic Forum posted a video entitled Eight Predictions for the World in 2030, there's that number again, which infamously forecasted a technocratic new world order in which you will own nothing and you will be happy. It doesn't take a stretch of an imagination to ponder how the WEF oligarchs plan to roll out sustainable development policies, which will ration consumer goods in a global sharing community that employs transient gig workers who will be rendered in the property that serves under a techno-communitarian rendition of neo-feudalism. But how will the globalists, technocrats of the WEF sway the virtual peasant class to be happy with their permanent state of digitally indentured servitude, right? So, you know, I mean, that's the big question, right? How are they gonna get us lured in? And that's where Barbara Marks Hubbard comes in. And I looked at the, um, the I, I took a quick side venture. I looked at those eight predictions, right? I went to their website. This is the World Economic Website, World Economic Forum, eight predictions for the world in 2030, written on November 12th, 2016, so like roughly six years ago. There's a link for people who I, I recommend you check it out for yourself. And you know, what are those things? Number one, all products will have become services, right? Number two, there's a global price on carbon, right? Because carbon is the big sinner, right? Three, US dominance is over. We have, you know, it's over for you guys. Sorry to say, John, your history. We have a handful of global powers now, right? Number four, farewell hospital, hello, homespital meaning you don't go anywhere anymore to be treated. You do it all at home with your, probably with your 3D digital printer. Five, we are eating much less meat. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And I, we'll get to that in a second, right? Number six, today's Syrian refugees are tomorrow's 2030 CEOs. Number seven, the values that built the West will have been tested to the breaking point. In other words, like we talked about earlier, all those values, family, stuff like that, over, right? By 2030s, we'll be ready to move humans toward the red planet. Of course, right? So these these are the, the eight predictions that they said that, that they were basing Barbara Marx Hubbard's literature on. And, you know, the, the funny thing is when you look at these people, right? And, you know, we can look at Barbara. There she is, the, the old hag before she kicked the bucket. Sorry, Barbara, we're probably gonna meet up in some afterlife somewhere, maybe or maybe not. But you know, anyway, I mean, the thing is, she, this is her, right? She comes in and she's a, she's a Jewish agnostic who has proclaimed what's called Christ consciousness of the new age, <laughs> right? Was, wasn't it the Jews that crucified Christ, right? And here, the, and she's not even a believer, and yet she is saying basically, you know, this is what it's all about in the future. And she's coming from, of course, a mega wealthy family, right? She went to Sorbonne, you know, she never had to eat, miss a meal. Uh, you can be sure of that in her life, right? Um, and, you know, so the buzzwords around this, right, is like global coherence initiative. I mentioned that one already, right? They're going to use these neurofeedback wearables so people can kind of zone out, right? They can kind of get into this space right so they're they're mesmerized and programmed and, and you know I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides because i actually downloaded the application i wanted to see what this is like, take a closer look because i know you know rolling recreating these people i know them personally right so I'm, i never would have thought that they were part of something like sinister but if you look at the whole picture you gotta say right and then the words here new normal we've heard that before right the stakeholder economy in the fourth industrial revolution right and and basically it says um you see here that, you know, if these people were real, you wouldn't have like the Rockefeller philanthropy bankrolling Hubbard's foundation of conscious evolution, right? In order to digitally engineer humankind into a new transhuman species, baptized in the name of technognostic Christ consciousness. Furthermore, he talks about how he'll expose Hubbard's collaboration with the globalists at the World Business Academy, corporatists at the Singularity University, you mentioned uh, Ray Kurzweil before he's the founder, uh, and and the you uh, the uh, the Eusekian human potential psychologists in connection with the Esalen Institute in order to establish a techno communitarian spiritualism that worships transhumanist evolution controlled by big tech companies, which will dominate the stakeholder economy in the fourth industrial revolution. Right. So this is something that people have to realize here. Okay, because let me. You know, I'm sure you will you will completely acknowledge this, John. What these people are talking about is the goals about cleaning the planet and raising human consciousness. And these are all 
they're good things, really, in a way. Exactly. They're things that are really they're, they're they're that is what we're going toward. We are evolving toward this stuff, but they have. Um, in a sense, what they I mean, when there's Rockefeller and these mega wealthy corporations behind it telling us they've got the solution. Well, I mean, didn't they create the problem in the first place? You know, exactly. they created the problem, exactly. Right? They created the lifestyle. <clears throat> they created the products. They created our freaking dependency on that. At the turn of the last century, everything was already going in a better direction. It was going electric. It was going Tesla Tower. We had people really invested in this and boom, what did they do? They, they inserted themselves into the whole equation, bought up everything, privatized everything, put everything in a drawer and put out fossil fuels. I just right. want to quickly insert something before you go on. And this right. is something I want to throw out a theory, Frank, and get your take on this. Number one, the red planet, Mars, which you mentioned earlier, might very well be the metaverse. How would you know? How would you know? They put some... True. They put something on you, they bring you to Mars, but they put you in the metaverse. You wouldn't even know. That's number theory number one. Theory number two, we might actually not be looking at an old hag here. We might actually be looking at artificial intelligence that is reverse engineering the journey to the desired solution. I know this sounds crazy, but all evidence points actually to that. There's a very slim chance that we have gone from light bulb to where we are now in a hundred years or a little more. It's just very slim chance that this has actually happened in an evolutionary scenario. Um, what that means is, again, extreme discernment. I do believe, I do believe we have the capacity to alter the course, but we must get so sophisticated in our knowledge and our discernment. And that's why it's so important that you bring the details, Frank. You bring the goods, you bring the receipts, you bring what we take, what we need well, I, I know these people. Like, look, this is this is Rollin McCready, right? He is the director of research at HeartMath. This is me interviewing him in 2012, 10 years ago, sitting in his office, right? Our film, Solar Revolution, you see above it, that's the film we put out. Right there, pictured in the middle at the bottom is this thing called a heartbeat. They're these um, sensors that, that they pick up um, the pulse of the universe. They're really bizarre. Like, they're, they're all over the planet. And uh, that's their website, right? And and basically what you end up in with is, I mean, I, I talked to the guy and it's true. They're all very in their head, right? And um, so, you know, and then they have this trailer, like we'll watch a couple of seconds of this too, because this, this is important for people to know that, that there's, you know, they have to think, have they been just swallowing this? Have they come into contact with these people? And they think they're absolutely all, you know, love oriented and heart centered and just want to fix the planet? Or are they really part of a, you know, a methodology that's been building over the last hundred or so years to move us to become trapped in this Noah sphere, which we'll get into in a second. So just, I'll just play you a couple seconds of this, right? It's really well made. We've all felt at one point or another, we are interconnected. But is this an illusion or a scientific reality? of experiments, researchers at the HeartMath Institute have discovered what they describe as heart coherence. Coherence is an optimal state in which the mind and emotions are brought into alignment and in sync with the heart's intuitive guidance. Practicing this state of coherence creates a cascade of neural and biochemical events that benefit the entire body especially our mental and emotional stability. The human heart generates a magnetic field that can be measured outside of the body. The vibrational pattern of that field changes based on our attitudes, emotions, and intentions, and can affect the mental and emotional states of others around us. Our Earth is constantly bathed in electromagnetic fields. These fields affect and connect every living organism on the planet, human beings included. We are not only all swimming in a common vibrational field, but each of us are contributing our own positive or negative vibrations to the field based on our thoughts, feelings, and interactions. 
And when you are in coherence, your heart resonates in the same frequency range as the Earth's magnetic field. When a group of people are in coherence together, this effect is magnified. Could large numbers of people synchronized in heart coherence generate a more coherent global field that can benefit others and help offset worldwide fear and incoherence? This is the pursuit of the Global Coherence Initiative. A global network of ultra-sensitive magnetic field detectors and other scientific instruments have been installed around the planet, measuring fluctuations in the field, creating one of the world's largest experiments for intentionally evolving human consciousness. By joining the initiative, you will practice methods that are helpful for increasing your personal well-being and energy levels, reducing stress, fear, and anxiety, while connecting you with your heart's deeper guidance for choices and decisions. At the same time, you'll be helping to shape the collective field of our planet for the better. As a participant, you will learn how to measure your coherence level in real time, along with hundreds of thousands of people in over 150 countries who are adding heart energy to the planet. We are at a point in the history of consciousness where we have an opportunity to make an evolutionary leap to a more cooperative and compassionate way of being. It's time to feed the field with more love and care for each other. Anyway, anyway there you go. It's like you heard the language, right? The evolutionary leap in consciousness, feeding the field. And all of it is true, John. Right. Oh, yeah, yes. it is true. It's all true. But there, there they were. <clears throat> there they were right in the video. On Everyone their looking at their screen. Every one of them looking in their screen. Right. And, it, and the funny thing is you can look at the screen. I, I downloaded the screens. Right. This is what it looks like in a way. Their app. Right. So what are the options here? You can do um, music for heart meditation. And believe me, it's it's music that you I couldn't listen to for very long. Um, you know, broadcast love, you know, collective compassion, Ukraine and Russia, of course. Right. Um, you know, there's not, there's nothing else going on in the world. Continuity of compassion, power of collective intention, eight minute power of collective intention, right? But basically, I mean, it's the soft, the, the soft new world. It's not like recognize the bullshit and your politicians and the lies they're telling you and change and get in their faces and change the policy so that AI won't take over your community. You know, it's no, it's sit back and love and you know and get into yeah. your iphone and watch the heartbeat they even have this thing you know like well yeah look they have this Frank. thing right oh. on, on the right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the new version see your coherence transformed into light so you can have you can buy this light bulb you can install it in your home and you can sit there and stare at this light bulb right Pulses. can i can i say something here frank i want to say oh, yeah, something yeah. excuse me as far as fuck that shit and i'll tell you why it's 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 exactly like Frank says. They use the right language. They even use truth. We have an aura. Well, guess what? You don't need scientific instruments to measure that. It's been known for eons since the beginning of time that we have that all of it is true. But here's here's what their real intention is. I'm not saying necessarily heart math, but whoever is funding them, because we know how this works. Think, min think minority report. What that means is, you shall have critical thoughts. You shall not agree with our course of action. We will measure that because we have the instruments to measure it. We can pinpoint it to your aura. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take you out for a little bit. You're going to go into an induced coma until that stress subsides and you can uh, and radiate love again. This is mandated um, transhumanism. This is what this equates to. And I'm all for the evolutionary journey. I'm all for us moving into a more peaceful state, but I'm all for this being a true individual consciousness journey and not a collectivism journey. And this is just, it makes me sick to my stomach because like you said earlier, it makes me realize that I might have contributed. Like I always say, I always say we have to discern. I might have contributed to some of that bullshit by not seeing it for what it was at the time. Well, that's it. I mean, we all are guilty of that if it's if you want to look at it as guilt, but in your evolutionary path, if you're practicing 
the a healthy skepticism toward everything, then you will never fall into that permanent <clears throat> trap. And one, one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, they actually have ways of measuring whether you're not in coherence with the rest of the community, right? And it's true because the, the word um, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research kept popping up, right? And then I'm, I'm realizing, wait a minute, where have I, where have I seen that before, right? Pr the pair, the pair, right? Well, I saw the pair because this guy, Professor Dr. Ernst Sinkowski, who is a pioneer of, of instrumental transcommunication, had a book by Pear. You see that red circle, right? Yeah. Pear. That is <clears throat> Princeton, um, basically Princeton Engineering and Anomalous Research. That's that's the company, or the, let's say the, the foundational research group that is basically created the experiments and the technology that has proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that humans, humans' thoughts can affect not just other humans, but they can affect matter. You know, remember we had some of those um, communication uh, in the Faraday cage that I, that I was telling you that we picked up in the 90s and we put some of those messages up on the screen because they were so relative to what's going on right now, this interconnection between dimensions, this interbleeding between dimensions, and that there's actually interdimensional beings that are beyond our dimensional perception, which are perceiving and interacting with us and that this veil could stand to actually come down as part of our natural evolutionary change, right? Not the, not the artificial one I'm saying, I'm saying that the natural one, the veil between these dimensions will begin to erode as we enter into this, what people call the 5D thing, whatever, you know, you want to look at it as, right? But it was all pioneered by PEAR, you know, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. And I know this because I actually knew, I didn't realize that how close you know, to the vine <laughs> that, you know, Tanya and I have been with our films and, and with the people that we've been interviewing, we've actually been right at the source of these people without even really, you know, um, you know, without, without questioning them, I'll always sort of, you know, like you say, you have a good, uh, you just, you give people a benefit of the doubt because you don't think that people are inherently evil. And it's for sure that the people at pair, I don't think they are. They're just a bunch of geek. If you look at their website and their, and their research, they look like a bunch of Birkenstock wares, you know? Uh, and <laughs> so they're, they're probably not these hardcore Rockefeller types in the boardroom juggling millions and billions to try and figure out, Hey, wait a minute. You know, we can actually hack you know, into uh, humans like and, and for me, it's no surprise. Why wouldn't they be the ones that are behind pioneering this information? Because if they can quickly get in and swoop in with their technology so that we're instead of going into nature and connecting, you know, instead of using the old fashioned technology we have, which is called, you know, public television, where we can inform ourselves of truth and new developments in science technology that really do benefit mankind and remove a lot of the obstacles which are keeping us enslaved. And this is another point that I wanted to bring up with these people, Rockefellers and whatnot, and, and the whole Mar Barbara Marx Hubbard clan of transhumanists that are pitching the solutions and this new stakeholder capitalism that they're calling it, right? Well, I mean, they're talking about climate change, you know. Well, we know for a fact, and that's something people will learn about when they do the Tale of Two Timelines webinar, is that climate change has nothing to do with carbon and nothing to do with man-made carbon dioxide at all, right? Remember that little chart I put up on a couple of shows ago where you saw that little sliver? That was the amount of percentage of carbon out of all the gases on the planet. And then out of that, we had to create a whole new circle just to show the tiny sliver that mankind generated like 0.08%. It's a non-significant impact. In any scientific experiment, it's not considered even worthy of an actual value to have an impact on the outcome of the experiment. What they're not telling you about is what's going on with the sun right now. What they're not telling you about this is that all the planets in the solar system are experiencing heightened energy uh, influx coming from the center of the galaxy, heating them up at the core, changing the entire, changing the magnetosphere of our planet and the, the heliosphere of the of the sun, changing everything. And it's affecting. And what us. they're not talking about they're is the geo. Talking about that. 
They're not talking about the geoengineering that they themselves. They're not talking about the geoengineering and the man-made weather, weather manipulation. They're not talking about John that they invented that that, that an inventor of Nikola Tesla invented a, 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 an, an an automobile in 1931 that did not require a motor that was pulling from the scalar source of energy. That um, Otis T. Carr, an American in the 1950s, invented uh, uh, basically a, a motor that. You know, it was the, the motor behind what you would call a UFO that would give us a whole new method of travel in the 1950s that um, uh, a guy called a uh, German guy um, developed a magnetic motor. I can't think of his name right now. It doesn't matter. But in 1954. He had a magnetic motor that would run, run indefinitely once you kickstarted it. And he had plans for production to put into cars. And that even if you want to talk about carbon combustion in 1989, Audi engineers developed a motor that drove on diesel uh, that drove 3,200 kilometers on one tank. I mean, that's enough, you know, driving for most people for half a year. They're not telling us about those things. Right. So, you know, that they are full of shit. Sorry. No, right? no sorry. They lose, all, they lose all credibility when they don't address the fact that we have technology. It's just that it's not technology that the bankers profit from. The Rockefellers are not going to make money. The Rothschilds are not going to stick money in their pockets if we debunk the central banking system and say, guess what, people? We don't need you anymore. It's been nice. We were dumb and, in, and con unconscious for the last uh, 20 centuries, but... Tell you what, we figured it out. Now you can guys, you guys, you made your money. Go retire on your islands. We're going to continue without you, right? They're not telling us that. They're putting us into what they're calling is stakeholder capitalism, right? And, and they're telling us that it's something Klaus Schwab, of course, one of the main guys behind it. Here's their Davos agenda is a form of capitalism in which companies seek long-term value creation by taking into account the needs of all their stakeholders and society at large, right? So what does that amount to? It amounts to the planet is at the center, right? So if you look at their literature, I went to their website here, I just highlighted a couple of the sentences, right? The most important characteristic of stakeholder model today is that stakes in our system are now more clearly global. Right. Economies, societies and the environment are mostly closely linked to each other more than ever before. Here's another word. Safeguard the planet. The planet is thus the center of global economic system and its health should be optimized in the decisions made by all other stakeholders. The planet. Right. Well-being of people in one society affects those of another um, because we're all global citizens now. Right. And COVID-19 was just a reminder of the global interconnectedness that no one is safe. And until everyone is safe. Right. So this is fear propaganda. And this is how they're using their um, terminologies that are all true. They're all borrowing, taking, stealing those words that we know are true. And this is why you're saying, how do we combat this? Right. We combat it by seeing through their like the we pull the curtain of the Wizard of the Oz and we see the little skinny man standing behind the megaphone. Because these are all little skinny people. I mean, you know, look at them. This is them here. Right. There they are, you know, the wonderful, you know, prophets of our time, right? There you see them, Bill Gates, right? Ursula von der Leyen would be happy to get on her knees and put on the zipper of Bill Gates anytime, right? Then Schultz, you know, the little dictator Trudeau over there, all these unconscious idiots, right? I mean, essentially, they're the actors on the stage that we've given the power to play. And, they're, oh, they, and we've resonated with their garbage, so we've given them... Are they, we've given the power to their stupid negative timeline, leading us to this transhumanist world, which so, yeah. all leads to Frank. What we've been talking about since the beginning. I'm glad you said this. Let's look again. Weather looking glass. The, the, the what we received as information way way uh, ten years ago was accurate or not? It's playing out. It's interesting. So I, I believe it's accurate. And and the the prophecy of looking glass was of Project Looking Glass that beyond a certain time and and we can take 2012 as kind of the turning point. There was gonna be this mass awakening. Basically, that's the premise of it all. So what are they doing? They're mimicking. They're mimicking. The everything that's happening within this mass awakening and they're wanting us to they're wanting to to, you know, uh, rope us in at the last minute into their version of it, which yeah. looks a lot like the real thing. But as always, it's a simulation. 
and they are pulling us in this in the simulation. That's why I keep saying I know um, it must be annoying, but this is the age of the sermon. We got to know these things and we got to be mature and adults here or are we going to lose it all? It's as simple as that. And we're going right. to live happily ever trapped in the illusion of a grand dystopia. I mean, it's literally that. And Frank, I appreciate you so much for your tireless effort into going into this. And you're going into this in depth. Of course, we mentioned it, but I want to quickly jump back on it in a tale of two timelines because it's a timeless piece of work that you created. And I know the reactions that we've been getting when people signed up and they came back and said, hey, this is amazing. Everyone should see that. What are you talking about that pertains to that in, in the webinar? Well, essentially, the, it's showing us essentially how timelines work. And it's, sh it's showing us that these timelines have actually been manipulated through the fact that that, you know, not just the, the, the new age terminology has been hijacked, which is something, you know, that we've we've covered pretty extensively. And I'm happy that we managed to get through as far as we did today. Um, but uh, but it actually goes back into historical events that took place. That, you know, how did we, because you, you have to ask yourself, how did we end up where we are now? It didn't just happen overnight. These things have been running for well over a century. And wherever you look, um, you end up finding out that, you know, the, the, the same me mechanism, modus operandi is the word, that is being used. They, they find uh, the words and the terminology that's out there, or they even create it, like I, I believe in the case of you mentioned it earlier, like Barbara Marx Hubbard, as this early prophet of the transhumanist movement, she began putting these words actually into the New Age. So I think you made an interesting statement before you said, I wonder if that whole New Age movement has been a fraud from the very start, right? Because they could see it coming because the looking glass technology, what it allows people to do that are running it is it allows them to see into the future that allows to see time flows, time streams, and they can clearly identify events that are not foreign. They're not so far in the future that you can't, you know, like 23,000 years in the future where you don't even recognize the planet anymore. No, they're actually immediately running forward from the perspective of the viewer onward. And they always end up at that 2030 point. And then they go blank, meaning the there's a something that happens in 2030 that changes it. And, and it's interesting that all this terminology that you see in the Hubbard material, right, is always talking about 2030. Now, it's stupid to put any kind of value on a particular number, but I think it's clear. And what we show also in the Tale of Two Timelines is that the idea of 2030 being a, they talk about it in the looking glass material, that there's a cosmic event that takes place, uh, not just what's going on right now, which is already this influx of thing, things, of energy and frequencies and, and um, you know, these, this maser thing we talked about last time. Um, but there's actually going to be something like major, really major, like so major, the entire planet will be hit by it instantaneously. And that could be in the form of a micronova. It could be a massive solar flare or it could be like, you know, Nibiru, like or whatever. Planet X returns and it has, you know, basically it it, uh, it comes to the, the perihelion arrives and it's right close to between Earth and the sun. That would rock the planet for sure. Right. So there's all these things that are that are actually that have occurred in history. And we show that, you know, we talk about that, how it was traced back and, and that there's actually real bona fide hard evidence that the science of cataclysm is something that's been debunked, like it's been debunked or pushed aside. Well, there's a reason for that, because some of the main pioneers of that science, uh, science were actually double agents working for the CIA. So their material was classified, taken off the market. It was replaced by material that was easily debunked. And once that happened, it turned into, oh, okay, this is all a bunch of bunk. Uh, nobody believed it anymore. But if we had, we'd been preparing society for these things for the last hundred years, then we, we'd be living in a different society right now. But the fact is the people that are telling us now that we should be doing the stakeholder capitalism are the very people that have prevented that information from getting out to us. So the Tale of Two Timelines is all about tools that learn, that help you recognize on the one hand, a you know we look at all the facts, we look at all the different building blocks of their of their world model, and and then we also show the opposite side, where you know the things that we have inherently built within our biology, which could change the game completely, but we are not being told about. So it's imperative for people to know that information, and to learn that and to trust that information. 
I'll just give you an example of how the universe works with us. It's a miracle. Every single day is a miracle. Like uh, today I got into the car. I told you we couldn't do today's show until like later, right? I went into town. I had to take care of some business. And I, on the way out, I threw a jacket in my car because I belonged to a friend of mine that was here about three weeks ago. And he forgot his jacket. So I figured, you know what? I'll just throw it in the car. And uh, I don't know why, but I just threw it in the car. And then I'm driving at my last stop, you know? And, uh, oh, I... I wanted to look at something. I turned around and I went around the block again and I saw that the recycling plants moved its location. So I made a note of it, turned around, went back on the way I was in. And at that same moment, the exact person who owns that jacket drove past me, saw me, beeped his horn. We both pulled over and I gave him his jacket. Beautiful. Right? And uh, if I if I hadn't turned around and gone to check out the recycling plants, new location, I would have one 10 seconds would have gone. I would have missed them. But I put the intention out there that I wanted to encounter him or at least meet up with him somehow. And the universe orchestrated it. I can, be, I can promise you that. This is what happens. This is how powerful we are as manifest, manifestors. Like we can manifest anything that we believe, anything. We've just been told that we're dwarves. We're actually giants, mental giants, right? We actually have so much capacity in our brains. We have such a capacity of creativity, of thought. We don't even have to be intellectual geniuses because, you know, IQ is overrated anyway. What's that all based on? It's all based on things they teach you in existing establishments, right? If you can memorize the game that they've put before you, which is an illusion anyway, you're considered smart, but you're not really smart. There's another form of intelligence out there. There's an emotional IQ as well. And these are all things we just need to learn to trust who we really are. And that's part of what I think, you know, the, the, the webinar is really kind of getting into ultimately. I know it's all under the guise of the Project Looking Glass and it's about the J-Rods and, you know, the time travel and all that stuff, which is very cool. It's a very cool premise to look at. But this day and age, things are more than they have to be more than just about, hey, that's cool. Right. I mean, Tartaria is cool, but is it going to solve anything for us right now? We have some impending issues. <laughs> we have some stuff that we have to deal with in the world right now. And if we don't get to them, we won't have time to go back and explore Tartaria and all those other illusions that have been put out there in front of us that we've unconditionally accepted. And for us to go back and question, wait a minute, where did I actually get that original thought from? Was that something that I read in some glossy magazine put out by someone that, you know, was part of one of those people in that network we've been talking about, uh, you know, so, you know, these are the kinds of internal cleansing processes we have to go through. But I think that's for later down the road. I think we really do need to kind of deal with the impending stuff that's coming at us or we will probably, you know, I don't want to put it out there in, in the fear sense, but it really is honestly the end of human biological civilization within 20 years if we do not put a stop I mean, look, it's that, that is the question I wanted to actually put in my notes. I wanted to ask you, is it too late? You know, are we old fashioned? Do we just have to accept the inevitable? No, right? Frank, no. Here's the thing. I, we, we just had two interviews with Dane Wigging from geoengineeringwatch.org. And Dane said, actually, I asked him, what was the tipping point for climate engineering? You know, what was that point where natural weather, where's that point coming where natural weather is not going to occur? He said it's 20 years ago, but he's not given up. He said it's 20 years ago, but he's not given up. So it, we are we're at this juncture. And if if this uh, wasn't something that we could win, we wouldn't have the passion and the joy and the inspiration in our hearts. So I wanted to say that I want to encourage everyone to go look at the uh, watch the webinar, A Tale of Two Timelines. People are coming out of it with just a, a very fresh perspective and new inspiration and hope so we'll put the link in the description really this i mean thousands of people have watched it and are, are loving it and frank has made it now easier than ever broken up in in different parts so you can you can kind of watch see if it is for you and then watch the rest of it well, yeah there's a description for each part so if you feel like you just want to dig into part three because that looks like it's interesting then do it by all means you can always if you feel like hey maybe this is something i do want to watch all of so then you can go back and most people you know a lot of people write me and say i had to watch it like three times <laughs> well, there's so much know, information just like our talks are packed that's why i'm always talking so fast yeah, <laughs> it's like exactly. i always feel like damn i'm talking too fast again <laughs> But there's, you know, there's just so much information and we just have to share it with people. People don't have that much patience anymore. We've already been at it for like an hour. And right? we're so going to and we're going to come back. There's going to be a part two because there's so much more ground to cover. And we are now um, we're at this juncture where we need to realize this artificial 
intelligence, uh, the, the processing speeds, the ability, what it does is exponentially growing now by the day. This is how exponential growth works. It's like a, a curve. It goes, you know, steadily, steadily. And then all of a sudden it jumps up. We're, we're here. We're in this juncture here. And we got to understand this because our, our vision is actually, I'll be honest with you. My vision of even my lifetime is in my lifetime. I believe we're going to live my family, my community pretty much without the assistance of technology. I truly believe that because I think and I know we have these abilities that are reawakening and one by one, we're going to just say, I don't really need to use this today. It's not going to be like we're going to abandon everything at once. It's going to be, oh, all of a sudden you wonder, oh, it, it's been a week since I picked up my phone because I didn't need it because I was in this organic reality. So what? as such, what we are envisioning does not enrich us materialistically. We're not selling you a vision of the future, which we're going to profit from for the rest of our lives, actually. To the contrary, we, we believe we will enhance all of our experiences when we truly remember who we are as organic co-creators. I think that's the, that's the vision here. That's diametrically opposed to the synthetic future. They want you hooked on them and their thing until you cease to exist uh, the way you are today. We're going to talk more about it. There's a lot more ground to cover. Also, it's we're going to have to speak very candidly about who are the uh, spiritual thought leaders that are completely have completely sold out and are visibly supporting this dystopian agenda while pretending to still, um, you know, work in an authentic realm. We're going to have to talk about it. It's just that time and. I'm going to do my best, try not to slander because that's not what this is about, but it's really about removing our energy from these false prophets and putting it where it needs to be. It needs to well, be here. Yeah, but, but you're, you know, you're not slandering if you're, if you're approaching these people and saying, look, I've been invest, I've invested in you. You know, I'm one of the people I bought your book or listened to your lecture or whatever. Um, and this part isn't gelling. How do you explain it? Because the, the thing is, if we start approaching these people in a very civil manner and hitting them with non, not any, doesn't mean the information isn't hard hitting, but along, along the information that we've been talking about today, to ask a Deepak Chopra, what is the difference between a synthetic Christ consciousness and an organic Christ consciousness? I'd love to hear his answers to those things. I'd love to hear his position on the fact that, you know, this could be the last generation of biological human beings. What's he doing about it? Or does he care? Or is he into this Barbara Marx Hubbard concept? In fact, I think he's, you know, on her list of, um, of people that she, you know, puts in from, or she used to, of course, she's not with us any longer, thank God. But, uh, you know, essentially this information network that's out there, it's, he's on that mailing list, right? <laughs> but listen, we've got Yuval Harari now in her place. He's, he's probably easier to pick on, right? So. And, and why you say Yuval? Here, if, if anyone's watching this, want to share this with Russell Brand, I believe Russell Brand has, you know, he's, he's, brought a lot of value to a lot of people. I see that humor, value, interesting and, and intelligent commentary, a lot of all of that. Like, I appreciate that. But here's Russell Brand officially opposing a lot of the great reset and talking critically and negatively about it. At the same time, he's buddy buddy with Yuval Noah Harari, who is a psychopath, excuse me, a complete psychopath. If he's yeah. even a real human being, a complete psychopath. I, I don't even know how you can stand to be in the same room with a person that has so much hate for our kind. And I'm talking about biological humans. Well, like, maybe you, well, maybe Yuval Harari is just an actor and he's only acting that part. He's actually a super sweet, spiritual, nice guy when he's off stage. Even worse than, even <laughs> worse than, but, but might be the truth. I'm just saying, Russell, yeah. please no, but the thing is, elaborate. But the yeah, we ask these people these questions and we and, and it has to be not just those people, it has to be our so-called politicians that we've apparently elected, right? In a so-called democracy. Well, they've taken our vote, so they have a, a responsibility to us. They can't just blow us off and say, I don't have time. They need a plan because the plan is going to have to encompass humanity in the next 20 years. You can't start in 20 years with a plan. You know, and it's clear if you look at the World Economic Forum, they've been planning since, you know, this, I've got more slides up, we don't have time for, but they've been talking about this since the early 2000s, at the very, you know, at the, at the very latest, if not sooner, because Klaus Schwab obviously has been 
developing his network back in the 1900s already. So, you know, he's not, he's not, a, this isn't his first barbecue. And, you know, um, you know, Barbara, you know, bless her little soul. Uh, she's been around since she was around 1929. So, you know, I mean, she's been around a long time feeding the field with her information. So we have a right to say, you know what? I thought these were all good ideas, but I hit a point where I thought, wait a minute, something's not right here. It's not adding up. If you're telling us that you're including this words like we're carbon sinners, but that information just doesn't gel if you took it, take a real hard look at the science. So how do you answer to that? Right. And the answer is not to cancel me. Right. That's not the answer. <laughs> right. And if enough people do that, there's way more of us. It keeps coming back to what I'm saying. We're so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. We just have to take back our power. And, and you're right. It's like for me, this idea of switching off electronics as much as I love them. I love getting on a flight because I know there's not going to be any Internet reception, no phone reception. And I shut it off and I know I'm going to have peace and quiet. So just, you know, pretend you're going to get on a flight, an extended flight. Maybe it's going to take a month. And you switch everything off and see what happens to you when you go through that tunnel <laughs> where you're not connected to that fe frenzy feed of information, which has been bombarding us for the and it's exponentially bombarding us as we speak, you know, with the war situation, with the energy crisis situation. I mean, you don't have that in America, but we, as you probably know, in Germany, you know, with this Nord Stream thing, which was a whole sabotage. You know, they're telling us, oh, we could be freezing all winter. And my energy bill went from 100 to 400, you know, this year in one month. Right. They decided to quadruple it just like that. <laughs> right. Frank, so, you, I mean, might, you might be able to you might be able to do that. But, but most people, I mean, especially people that are on fixed income and wages, it's game over. And how long is the government? What's the government going right. to do? Yeah, they're going to subsidize. But what are they going to do? Put condition on those. I mean, they have literally they have. Um, they've taken over the gas company in Germany. It's now, yeah. it's not in government hands. So they're right. literally in control completely. It's not even yeah. private hands anymore. What are they going to do? They're going to say, here you go. We're going to subsidize. But are you, are you current on your shots? Are you current on this and that? And, yes. and please install this app on your phone. And yeah. that's how it's going to, I mean, that's their yeah. And you have to ask the question, like, if you think you have a job now and you're getting a, you know, a fixed income and they come along with a universal basic income model, and it might actually be somewhere around the amount of money that you're making now. And you think, hey, this is cool. You have to ask yourself, is it worth selling my soul for some kind of superficial materialistic safety net? Right. Is that really going to be worth it in the long run? Are your children going to be happy growing up in a society that is regulated to the max where they can't even turn around on the corner anywhere without being monitored? In fact, that was funny. I was watching that um, late one night. I was just trying to, you know, when I try to tune out and uh, just shut my mind down from all this like super hyper information. I, I was watching the James Bond film Spectre, <laughs> you know, with Daniel Craig. And if you look at that film, it's like, what's it about? It's about this network, this octopus. There's this octopus symbol on his ring, right? And he goes around trying to figure out what's behind it, right? And it's it's basically a surveillance society. So they've already been telling us what they're planning in all these films. So this is going to be reality. With uh, Elon Musk's Starlink system out there, you know, they're giving information to the Ukraines, which are actually just the proxy military for the United States. They've been equipped by thank you Germans and by thank you Americans to the tomb of $67 billion, by the way. Think about that. What would you do with $67 billion, John, right? Well, what could we, what kind of damage could we do to the cabal with that kind of money, right? But what are they doing with that money? They're giving it to to, to uh, that, you know, pedo guy, Zelensky, so he can get howitzers and he can kill the generals of Putin's army, which is the, which was the, uh, the gentleman's war for boat and thing. You never kill the generals, right? Even though war is bad, but this is what they're doing. They're just hitting... Like they're just pushing every button they can to provoke what could be an escalated situation. Let's just hope it never happens. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I think as long as we talk about this and as long as we keep the dialogue going, we we change the odds. But I think we've already changed the odds. We've there was something that happened with PayPal last week where they had to backstep because they realized by, you know, reporting on people and shutting their accounts that are, you know, saying incorrect things that have been canceled. They can't do that. 
And I we think put a, we evidence. put a short out. I, I right. can't even tell you how how big of a shit storm just on our little comment section. People were like canceling PayPal. Boom, boom, boom. It's like, yeah, no, they, they can't do that. And what that proves to me is that what we started back in May when we had our first conversation with the idea of intention, you know, of, of focusing people not with these stupid devices like, you know, the Global Coherence Initiative, but with our actual physical intention in, in terms of visualizing a new timeline, not trying to destroy their timeline. You can't, you know, visualize a new world by destroying an old timeline. But if you visualize a new world, right, and it, and it doesn't mean it's all just lovey, dovey, fluffy, heart stuff like heart math, but actually like concrete things, free energy devices, inventors that make it headlines, you know, you could you could make it your own unique game, whatever you visualize. But alone, I think because we put that out there and millions of people watch that, I think we've we've made a difference. And I think we we're going to keep making a difference because every little thing counts. Every little bit is going to register in that global coherence network that they that they're monitoring us yes. with. Right. Exactly. And I, I can tell you this. Um, we will never stop. It's the truth is so empowering. And I want to say this. I've been saying this for a while now. The truth is always empowering. It's our resistance to the truth that is challenging. It's that inner. I don't want to see it. But once we embrace the truth, it's always empowering because at the same time that you see a truth that's um, that shocks you or that you don't like immediately, you have a natural instinct and intuition to look at something what would be better what would be greater what would be more wonderful and this is exactly what why truth is so important and only truth can do that all the lies won't do that the truth will will continue to speak the truth frank um this this requires definitely a part two at least a part two so um for, for now I want to thank you again for an incredible conversation, an incredible expansion of thought and, and consciousness. Um, I want to say this as a general statement to the great reset crowd and all that it entails. You can shove it where the sun don't shine. I'm absolutely not interested in that. And um, we will continue to feed this beautiful timeline and continue to pull back the rug on everything until every last piece is uncovered, laid out in the open, until they're naked, until they're naked and and nothing is left of their goods. Nothing is left of their wealth. And you will see that will happen quickly. And we'll invite more and more people on this positive timeline. Ultimately, we will also invite the perpetrators to a certain extent. If they wish and have a change of heart, we will extend that invitation and say, actually, we want you. We want everybody finally to jump over on this positive timeline. So this is it for me, Frank. What are your uh, parting words for today? Well, we've said a lot. I just think the idea of, um, you know, registering and, and uh, monitoring your thoughts when you're listening to this conversation, you know, if, if it's making you feel uncomfortable, it's probably a good thing because the cognitive dissonance is the first step toward recognizing when there's something that you knew intuitively was not right, that you've perceived, but you've been avoiding it. Because for the sake of convenience and for the sake of fitting in with society, because we're face it, we're social creatures. We like to be together. We like to be in, you know, families and communities. We highly value that. So for us to have to embrace information which pushes us outside of that comfort zone, meaning that some of the others in that community and, and that family and that internet close set of, uh, network of friends might actually fracture. That's something that that's a price you might have to pay. And that's sometimes not so comfortable. But the good thing is that when you break that bond and you begin to go into free fall mode, you're caught up by others that are like minded and this new energy out there that you're noticing. You know, you said to me before we went on today that you're noticing that there's just this flux of energy developing. There's this movement right now. And we're just kind of surfing it. And I think we just have to we have to stay on the ball and we have to realize that we're immortal souls that are very powerful and not worry about a few scrapes and broken bones that we get along the path. Because in the end, if we keep at it, we will prevail. Yes, sir. Amen. I tip my hat to you, my soul brother uh, from another mother. Thank you so much. Uh, Inspire Tribe, please check out a tale of two timelines. Uh, Frank's amazing webinar. Thousands of people have already watched it, love it, and uh, we can only echo that, you know, a beautiful piece of work. Frank Jacob, thank you again for joining us today. We'll have you back very, very soon because we have so much ground to cover. 
Um, always a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine, Jan. Inspire Tribe, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you. We love you. And we'll be back with you again very, very soon.